getting some other gigs, but uh, I needed something and somebody contacted me and there was a rock and roll singer named Ray Peterson uh -huh. who had a, a hit on a song called Tell Laura I Love Her. Yeah. And Corina, Corina. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for a bass player. So I took the job as I played bass too. I went on the road with Ray playing in a rock and roll band. Yeah. And see, when I was still coaching in Iowa, the last four years that I was there, or the last three years that I was there, a friend of mine who was the band director at Creston, who was like 35 miles away or 30 miles away, he and I decided to put a quartet together. The only problem was there wasn't a bass player in the area. So we both decided to learn how to play bass. He was a trombone player. And so <clears throat> I taught myself to play bass and so did he. And he, and I said, who are we gonna have for drums? And he said, well, I have a student, he's a sophomore and he's really good. We can just get him. And I said, okay. So we got this kid, and he was absolutely amazing. And it turned out, I don't know if you've ever heard of John Robinson. Mm -hmm. JR. Yeah. The Quincy Jones drummer. Yeah. That was him. <laughs> and so here I am playing with one of the best drummers in the country. Yeah. He's not even out of high school yet. <laughs> but the funny thing was, John was big kid he was six four or six five and he was on the Creston basketball team and they weren't in our conference but we played them twice a year. Uh -huh. and so I remember it was always funny because I'd be sitting at one end of the court and coaching against John yeah <laughs> and know that a couple of days later we're going to be playing uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> whatever you do don't hit that guy's feet <laughs> yeah yeah oh, he, he was or his great. hands <laughs> um, but you know he was only a sophomore so he didn't play that much yeah but um you know as as a drummer he, he's one of the greatest i've ever known yeah and he's probably made more money playing drums than anybody in in the country probably because he's he's recorded you know he there was a quite a story um he told me this. He went when he got out of high school. He went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Uh huh. And he got a girl pregnant during his freshman year. And he dropped out of school, and he started playing with some show funk band in Boston. And they traveled all over the Northeast United States, playing at at uh, lounges and clubs where they would be for a couple of weeks. And he said they were in Cleveland playing one night and as it so happened the group Rufus with Chaka Khan was in town and after their concert they came to the club where John was working uh -huh. and their drummer had just given notice uh -huh. and they heard John play one set and they offered him the job with Rufus. Yeah. yeah. So he said this was 1978 and he had a $30,000 a year retainer which was Good bread yeah. then. Yeah. But he had to move to LA. So he moved to Los Angeles and they went right into the studio and did their master jam album. Uh huh. Turned out Quincy Jones was producing the album. And he asked uh, John if he'd be interested in doing any of his other work. And John said, Oh, yeah. 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 So the first thing he did was Michael Jackson's Off the Wall album. Mm hmm. Then he's, he's done everything that Quincy has produced since then. Yeah, I'm sure. And yes. the bass player um, on the Michael Jackson album was Lewis Johnson from the Brothers Johnson. And mm -hmm. so then he got John to do their next date. And then George Benson hired him to do his date. And he ended up recording with over 100 different artists. Uh, yeah. With hit records. Uh, yeah, yeah, not just records, but hit. No, he told me he went from 30,000 to six figures in less than a year. Good for him, though. I mean, he worked. Oh, hard. absolutely. Yeah. He deserved it.
Yeah, because, exactly. You know, he, he had Buddy Rich kind of chops, but yeah. he, he only used what he needed to use. He always mm -hmm. had that sense when he was even 15 years old, he had such a sense of what was right to play yeah, right. at the right time. Yeah. Never had to you say anything to John. Yeah. No. Well, I, there's been a lot of kids that you've helped with at the jazz camps. I, I, I don't know if you've worked with any other ones, but the one in Sacramento, I know we've hung out That's a the lot. Only, no, that, well, I did do one year at Mammoth. Uh-huh. Oh, that's right. You told me about that. Yeah. And I have done some single day things. I, I, I've never really tried to sell myself as a music teacher because I think a lot of the kids know more than I do about music. But I, had, I was telling one of my sons last week, uh, I did a, a short clinic at, East, at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, which is near St. Louis. Uh -huh. And I, they had me come in and work with their big band. So I listened to the band play and, and then made some suggestions and then, had a question and answer section and one of the kids in the trumpet section raised his hand and he said what suggestion do you have for somebody who wants to make a living as a jazz musician and i said marry a woman with a good job yeah exactly <laughs> and insurance <laughs> yeah but, in a sense, I'm speaking from experience because I married a lady with a good job. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> she had her own company. <laughs> <laughs> she had job security. Yeah. Uh, especially now, it's so hard to get any gigs. Well, I mean, COVID notwithstanding, but I'm hoping that after people being shut in for so long, that they will be wanting and pushing for more live entertainment yeah. once it's over with because I feel like people are recognizing the need for it a little bit more yeah but you know now the the part of the business that i've been really deeply involved in is big band music yeah and i know uh, the glenn miller band which has always been the busiest of the big yeah. bands is out doing a few dates now yeah but with the Tommy Dorsey band, we've only had one date this year. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how did you end up being the leader of that one? Well, it's kind of a long story, but I'll make it short. But Buddy Morrow led the Tommy Dorsey band for 33 years. Mm -hmm. Buddy was one of my dearest friends. Yeah. But it, it happened that Buddy lived here in Orlando. But he oh, was okay. gone about 40 weeks or more a year with the Dorsey band. Yeah. And one of his neighbors was Linda. Mm hmm And in 1984, <clears throat> Linda's husband passed. And in 1985, one night in June of 85, I was being featured on a Monday night jam session thing, the club year in... Altamont Springs and Buddy was home for a couple of days and he and his wife invited Linda to go out for the evening with them for dinner and and she yeah. couldn't do that but she said she'd meet him later and have a drink was well, it just so happened Buddy and Carol and Linda came to the club where I was playing mm -hmm. so when um break time came around. I went over to say hi to Buddy. I didn't really know him, but I had played a couple of pickup band gigs with him. Yeah. I went over to pay my respects. And he introduced me to Linda and his wife, Carol. But I was there for maybe a grand total of 30 seconds. Yeah. And then I went around another part of the room to talk to some friends. And all of a sudden, Buddy is tapping me on the shoulder. And he said, Terry, are you married? And I said, no. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> he, he said, you see the blonde chick with my wife? Uh, yeah. He said, I think she digs you. <laughs> now, 
she had no idea this was going on. Carol sure put didn't. him up to that. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's amazing. But I said, I'm, I'm busy. I'm, I'm working. If I could get her number, you know, name and number, maybe I'd give her a call. Yeah. He said, I'll see what I can do. So I got back up on the bandstand and I was playing a tune and I had my eyes closed while I was soloing. And when I opened my eyes, Buddy Marl was standing in front of me with a napkin with Linda's name and number on it. And His wife was determined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that Fortunately was, for both of you. His yeah, wife it was. was anyway, so then Linda and I got married six months later. And it was the third time for both of us and neither of us was anxious to get married, but all of a sudden, there we were. And yeah. It's been, it'll be 36 years this January. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Anyway, back to the Dorsey thing. Yeah. So Buddy goes back out on the road. Well, we became better friends, and it got to the point where Buddy would call me from the road and say, what are you doing for the next two weeks, for the next three weeks? For the next month. Uh, well, I got this and this and this. And they'd say, Can you get out of it? Come on out and ride the bus with me. <laughs> yeah. So I did that. And over the course of a number, that started in 86 and went up through the time that Buddy passed in 2010. Mm -hmm. And at one time or another, I played every chair in the sax section. I'm sure. And and when Buddy passed away in 2010, I couldn't take over the band then. He wanted me to, but I couldn't take it over because I had my own big band. Yeah. And we were working. I had a lot of contracts that would conflict with Buddy's date. Yeah. And so this, the vocalist took over the band, Nick Hilsher. And um, he led the band for a little over a year. And then he got called back. He had been with the Glenn Miller band for quite a while. Yeah, I was going to say, was, I, wait a minute, he leads the Glenn Miller band, doesn't he? So, okay. Yeah, they, okay, they called that's how it, Nick okay. to go back with the Miller band, yeah. which was really home turf for him. For him, yeah. So he went back, and then Carol Morrow asked me <clears throat> if, starting the next season, if I could take over the Dorsey band, and I did. So that was 2012. Nice. But Buddy used to, on a number of occasions, would tell me, you know this book. Someday you'll take this band. I know you will. Yeah. And he said, you know, that's what Tommy said to me. Because Buddy started playing with Tommy when he was 18 years old. Yeah, I was going to say, he, I think he was really young when he started. Yeah, when... and he, he was Tommy's pet. Tommy wasn't yeah. easy to get along with. No. He always was really good to Buddy. And Buddy had said, you know, Tommy told him, he said, someday this will all be you. Yeah, so the torch got handed over. But yeah, Buddy was a, a prince. He, he was really one of the dearest people I've ever known. Yeah. And um, he was really like a father to me. Yeah. And um, I missed him. I'm sure. To this day. Yeah. yeah. He, he was, well, it was almost universal, you know, Thousands of guys, I'd say, at least hundreds of guys, played yeah. for Buddy through all the years that he had his own band and all the years that he led the Dorsey band. And I've yet to encounter anybody who didn't love him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He, he was very direct on the band. If, yeah. if you did something he didn't like, he didn't wait around to tell you. Well, but in a way, it's good, you know. We, we always right used away. To, every, everybody dreaded what we called the buddy bark. <laughs> I sat next to him for most of the time that I played. And I, you know, Buddy knew the book better than anybody. had. He'd hear a clam. Mm -hmm. And I'd hear... <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> so nobody wanted to be... The, the person that Buddy was barking. About. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like Goodman's uh, Ray or Glare. Or whatever. Yeah, only, only much nicer. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and, and really, 
the thing about Buddy's band, it always swung really hard. And I always say that starts from the top. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think uh, indicative of that. One night we were playing somewhere and we had a lead trumpet player that on one of the charts had a written high G and decided that a, a, a B above the G would, would be better. Would really be cool. So he goes for that B above the G and gets nothing but air, you know, mm -hmm. an air ball. Mm -hmm. So instead of having that big fat G on top of the closing chord, there's nothing there. <laughs> and you hear Buddy going, <laughs> <laughs> So I was right behind this guy when he got on the bus and Buddy was already on the bus sitting in his seat towards the front. And the guy stopped and he goes, buddy, I'm so sorry. I thought I could make that be, and I'm just, I'm just so sorry. And buddy says, oh, what the hell? You were going. And, I, <laughs> yeah. and then handed him a vodka bottle. <laughs> just don't get too, just don't try too much more. <laughs> no, no. But that was the thing was that, that, that Buddy, all he really wanted from you was for you to give your best. Yeah. Give it, you know. Give it your all. Even though that that clam might irritate him momentarily, he still yeah. always appreciated that the effort. you weren't phoning it in. Yeah. Well, at least he had that balance on there. That was Oh, cool. he did. Yeah, he really did. Yeah. What do you think is probably one of the most uh used lessons you've learned from him over the years that you've used for yourself <laughs> uh, that's repeatable anyway <laughs> well that's, i'm trying to think of something repeatable <laughs> um well one thing uh, particularly when it comes to a band like that um and and when you're touring and, and you're playing night after night my own inc inclination would have been to have a different program every night. Yeah. Just because I, I don't want everybody to get bored. Yeah. In the band. Right. Well, Buddy was the opposite. Buddy was like Satchmo. Mm -hmm. Same program every yeah. night. But his reason for that was he wanted the band to be as tight as it could possibly be. Yeah. And that's how you really get tight is the repetition. Yeah. You know? right. So uh, I think I um, made a modified version of that. I, I mean, to this day, if we're doing a, a typical two hour concert, a great amount of that concert will be in the exact same order that Buddy did it in for so many years, just because yeah. I know it works. Right. That sequence of tunes that he had constructed. Yeah. I know it works. Yeah. And um, I'll still make some changes uh, as long as the things that I change are maybe basically the same character, same tempo, same kind of thing, mm -hmm. but maybe just different sounds. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think too, uh, is course i don't have to do it i have a road manager but buddy was very very insistent on the money in that as soon as he walked into the back door of wherever we were playing and somebody would come up and say oh buddy it's so great to have you here i've wanted to meet you forever i love your playing i love the band and buddy yeah. know, where's my check uh-huh Get it up front, yeah. After he got the check, then he could be as nice as you want to be. <laughs> but he's not wrong. He probably got bit a uh, number sure. of times that he had yeah, to do that, that came from experience. Mm -hmm. But like I say, I, I have a road manager who does that, so I don't have to do You don't that. have to. <laughs> no. And Buddy did too, but he, if, if, it, if that's what it came to, I mean, usually yeah. his road manager would take care of that. Yeah. But, if, you know, when people came up to Buddy right off the bat, he wanted to make sure that element was handled. 
Yeah, the motor doesn't walk off at the door. Yeah. And uh, now, since I didn't spend as many weeks at a time as Buddy did on the boat, uh, we had a, a different way of doing things as far as checks and, yeah. and pay and everything was concerned. I think the longest we've been out is six or seven weeks at a time. Yeah. So we could just pay the guys with checks, which the road manager would take with them. Right. But when we were on the road for extended periods of time, when Buddy was the leader, every Friday was payday. And Buddy would give us, uh, first he would give us our check and we would endorse it and then he would cash it for us. And he oh. carried, we always called the brick. He had this, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he had about $10,000 in his pocket. And right. He would always um, take care of, of everybody's business. But since we were out on the road, we actually needed cash. Yeah, exactly. It Jack wasn't doing Jack. us a lot of good. Yeah. Somewhere in Nebraska, you know, yeah. we, we needed cash. Yeah. So he would, uh, that was his routine every Friday morning. And of course, in those days, um, in terms of the amount of money that you got in cash, that might not last you until next Friday. Yeah, especially if you so had the weekend. Guys were always getting advances. I'm sure. But he had his own bookkeeping system that never failed, you know? Oh, you, you need 50 bucks? Yeah, boy. And so when he cashed your check on Friday, he never failed to take out the money yeah. that he had advanced. Yep, yep, because now, otherwise again, not coming back, yeah. Yeah, I saw how he did that, but I've never had to realize <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> but you haven't forgotten it. <laughs> no, no. I remember one time, I, uh, I don't know where we were, but he and I went to breakfast. And so when we came back, I went to my room, and he went to his room and he called me in a panic. He couldn't find his cash. Uh-oh. And so right away, he's thinking maybe the maid had made up his bed and everything. I don't know why, but she had made, just made up the bed. She didn't change the sheets. We were not going to be staying there. Oh. But anyway, he couldn't find, I, he says, help me. I can't find my bed. So I, I ran down the room. He was literally tearing stuff out of the suitcase and oh no <laughs> you know and he's going nuts can't find his money well it was maybe 10 grand yeah know? so it was yeah worthy of a little freak out yeah and I said well where did you have it last and right here oh that goddamn maid no she took it I know she I said well, well wait let, let's look around and I just put up the cup and reached under the cover, and there it was, yeah. under the blanket. And he, he was going absolutely nuts. I'm sure. But, honey, how much did Carol find that one time? Uh, when she would clean out the closet every so often. Yeah. Find money. She and Sarah. Was yeah, there. she would clean out. <laughs> and Buddy, you know, had always had nice clothes. Yeah. But some of them he passed along to me. Um, but <laughs> Carol was going through his closet, and this happened more than once, and take a sport coat out of the closet and start going through the pockets. One time, I think it was over $3,000 she found <laughs> on the inside jacket of his sport coat. So she and their daughter immediately went shopping. <laughs> honey I found a thousand dollars yeah yeah of course that's the opposite of Peter Appleyard you know did you ever know Peter I've met the, him a couple of times yeah player? yeah he used to come to Florida and do a couple of weeks at a time playing with my big band uh-huh and we'd do a lot of Benny Goodman stuff but uh, Linda's sister used to keep my books from from I had a, a corporation. And one time, 
it was about six or eight months after Peter had been here and played with us. And Pam said, uh, I can't, you, you have a check that hasn't cleared, Peter Appleyard, and it's for $3,500. I said, really? Yeah. So I had to call Peter in, in Canada and say, Peter, gave you a check back in March. Yeah, whatever it was, yeah. Or whatever, you know. You never, you never cashed it. And he said, oh, I guess I, oh. So I'll look around. Well, he found it and cashed it. But he just this is a fair amount of money just went yeah. right over the top of his head. <laughs> you know, gone. I shouldn't have said anything. I should have just put the money back in my account. Because I don't think he would have ever known the difference, you know. <laughs> but he Peter was a wonderful guy. He was he was just and yeah, he was a national treasurer in Canada. Yeah. And and yet, you, you, he was a bit addled at times. And yeah. My favorite story is one morning I was fixing breakfast, and he says, Terry, you think it would be all right if I was to call Elfrida, his lady up in Canada? Yeah. I says, Here, go ahead. And I'm frying eggs, and he goes, Terry, I can't seem to get a dial tone. And I looked, and he was trying to make the phone call with the TV remote control. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Well, I have a reason for that. <laughs> I said, if you dialed up a porno movie, you're going to pay for it yourself. <laughs> Whatever combination you just hit, you're paying that. <laughs> yeah. One time we had a day off, but I, was, I had a gig of my own. And so Peter rode to the post office with me and decided he'd like to walk back to the house a couple miles away. And I said, do you think you could find and he says, oh, yes, yes. Well, hours and hours went by, and Peter didn't show up. Oh, and no. I drove out, and I looked all over the neighborhood for him, and I couldn't find him. And I finally, I said to Linda, I have to go. I've, I've got to be out at Disney or someplace. Someplace, yeah. So I took off, and so she started looking for him. And she finally found him just walking down the sidewalk someplace. And this is... <laughs> Five hours after I dropped him off, he said, you know, I did. I, I realized I got lost. He said, Todd. And he was going into big stores like Builder Square and other places. I say, you happen to know the orchestra leader, Terry Myers? <laughs> Do you know where he lives? <laughs> yeah. these, these people had no idea. You know. He was so completely lost. Oh, but you know, well, the funny thing about that, that guy, though, and I got to tell you, he, he could be he could be in a fog sometime. But when he walked on the band, mm -hmm. yeah. he was amazing. You know, he oh, played yeah. great. The audiences loved him. Mm -hmm. He was a showman that wouldn't quit. He yeah. was just he was wonderful. I, I really, and he was a wonderful guy. He was yeah. really a yeah. man. So that, that that was fun. But sometimes amazing <laughs> yeah sometimes you need a little bit of a leash <laughs> one other story i remember once he uh one of my guys had forgotten a blue blazer which we were wearing in those days and i had a couple extras hanging in the dressing room i can't remember why but i said yeah go back we were playing at bush gardens over in tampa yeah and he, he went back into the dressing room and got this coat off the rack. He came out and he goes, look, I found this in my pocket. And it was one of Peter's hearing aids. And it had been in there for a year. <laughs> and I don't even know how it got there. Because Peter always had his own clothes. I, yeah. I don't know how his hearing, <laughs> but it was his. I, and I don't know how it got into this blazer that didn't belong to it. <laughs> He played a gig, uh, well, Saunders hired him for Decatur one year, and uh, I, I, I was up in uh, his and Tilly's room, sitting with Tilly, 
And Saunders walks up and he sits down at the table in just this deep sigh. <laughs> and of course, Tilly and I are staring at him like, okay, what gives? You'll, you'll let loose with it eventually, just spit it out. And so finally he goes, this is a stupid question. Do either of you know where Peter, Peter Appleyard is? <laughs> <laughs> of course Tilly had a comment or two about how would we know kind of thing he goes I said it was a stupid question and I said well Saunders I was over hanging out with Hedges and Galloway last night over on the other side of the hotel and I got lost getting back he's probably lost it by the pool somewhere he goes all right don't get lost again go look for him over there and then I'll go look for him over here okay fine so I walk out over where I had gotten lost the night before and there's Peter just there's this one I don't because you played Decatur right uh, yeah. they had that little sort of glass enclosed kind of half dome corridor yeah. It, yeah he was just it was snowing outside he was just standing up there just staring straight up <laughs> <laughs> watching the snow I went Peter and he goes yes I went, you all right? Yeah, it's very pretty. Yeah, it is. You're on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, he, he played at Bush Gardens with us a number of times. And, but we played all over Florida with him. Yeah. He never failed to knock it out of the park. Oh, yeah, that's every time. Did you ever know, uh, you know, I, I had a great affinity for Chuck Hedges. Oh, and, yes. Uh, he, when I first met Chuck in 85 or so, he, I told him, I said, Chuck, I need help. I'm playing at Rosie O'Grady's. It's mainly a clarinet gig, and I'm not a good clarinet player. And he says, listen, I know all the tricks. He said, every time I see you, I'll help you. And he did. Every yeah. time I would see Chuck, he'd have some other little tip to give me. And, and, yeah. and was really my clarinet guru, if there is such a thing. But we had developed uh, a relationship, which was, and since that, all I'll tell you is we always had a message. That yes, I, I remember uh, the message. You remember that. <laughs> and uh, I would be playing with all red, you know, and by the way, I got to say this, you know, I would have, all of the opportunities that I've had through the years and, and, and so many of the opportunities I've had through the years come directly as a result of the opportunities that Bill Allred gave me. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, exposure is a dirty word in the music business, but I yeah. got exposure because of Bill Allred. Yeah. I'm always grateful. Only because the word exposure is usually preceded or directly followed by, and it doesn't pay. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. But in this case, it always pays. Yes. But anyway, in all those years, I got to know Chuck. I'd be on the bandstand with Bill, and maybe a little old lady would come up to my side of the stage and have a note for me. And I'd open up the note. And I would say, <laughs> go bleep yourself, you know? And I'd look in the back of the room, and of course, there's head <laughs> laughing, laughing yeah. his butt off, you know? <laughs> One time there was a little kid, couldn't have been six, seven years old, gave me the note, you know? I think Hedges used me for that one time. Yeah, he may I have. I found out what it was written down. I told him, don't you ever do that to me again or I'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> he may have. And But one time with the Allred Band, we, we went to Milwaukee and we were playing a party up there. And after we played the party, we went to this lady's house who had hired us. Her name was Jean. Jean Hedges is a good friend. And and Carol, and so um, she was a, re a mortgage mm -hmm. and she mentioned that next week, um, uh, 
Chuck and Carol had refinanced their house and they were going to have the closing next week. Yeah. Said, oh, really? <laughs> You're going to be there for the closing? And she said, yes. And I said, yeah, a pencil and paper. And she says, yeah, I know where you're going with this. And so she <laughs> gave me a pencil and paper. And so I wrote some stuff and, and yeah. gave it to her. And about three weeks later, I get this thing in the mail. It was from the closing. And it was a very official looking piece of paper. It had been signed by Chuck and witnessed by Carol and yep. notarized. Yep. And it says, I, the <laughs> undersigned Chuck Hedges, do hereby agree at the earliest possible occasion to go bleep my son. <laughs> and it was in their stack of, you know, I was trying <laughs> about a hundred things. <laughs> and Jean said that the attorney couldn't wait to get to that part. Yeah. He knew it was in there. And make Chuck read it, too. He did. And yeah, Chuck read he... it and signed it. And so I, we framed it. We had it on the oh, wall. Oh, you do? You've got it. I have the paper. Yeah. Oh, my God. I remember him telling that. He goes, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. He was but he was <laughs> laughing. I had no idea how he did it. <laughs> yeah. The next time I saw him was a few months later at, at Sacramento. Uh-huh. And went over to the Red Lion. And, and yeah. He was at the bar. Of course. And he saw me come in the room and he, he got down. He <laughs> just put his head on the bar, <laughs> held his hand up, and he said, you win. <laughs> it's over. But, but it I, wasn't over. I, I, well, no. But <laughs> I, I must tell you, and I, I I tear up when I think about it, but we were on a, our all-red Midwest tour and Chuck was on his deathbed. Yeah. And I called him and, and was riding in the car. But I called him. Yeah. And we talked for a little while. And I knew it was the last time I was going to talk to him. Yeah. And his voice was real weak. But I said, okay, Chuck, listen, I got to go. You know, I love you, man. And he says, go bleep. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> he got the last word. Yeah, he did. So Alan he did something similar to him too, but only he couldn't talk by that time, Hedges. And uh, so Alan was saying something, and I guess Carol got on the phone and said, well, he, he, he's trying to say something, and I, I don't know what he's trying to say. Mm. Alan said, that he's probably trying to say this, and yeah. Carol said it, and Chuck started nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he was a wonderful guy, <laughs> and you know, sometimes when well, Alan too, but sometimes when I need inspiration and I want to listen to a real clarinet player, yeah, yeah. I listen to those guys. <laughs> but oh, um, Chuck was he had his hard edge, but yeah, I I didn't, I didn't, yeah. No, I miss him. I miss his laugh mostly. Yeah. It was the full body laugh. Came up from the toenails, man. Yeah. Somebody posted recently um, a TV appearance. I think it was the Ed Sullivan show. Uh-huh. And it was Chuck when he was really young and he was playing with Dick Ryderbush. Uh-huh. And they were doing some just tempo de terra ass tune. I, really? I, I can't remember what it was, but I'm listening it. to what he was playing, and I thought, why wasn't he recognized worldwide as one of the really, really, really great players? I know. You know? Yeah. Well, I remember when I first started playing clarinet, I don't remember if I told you this or not. I may have. He and Abe Most, <clears throat> at the Red Lion, of course, he and Abe Most, I had first started playing clarinet and so both of them were trying very hard to help and uh, Abe was trying to tell me uh, different things to do with the embouchure and Chuck is disagreeing with him and telling him no we should do this and so they're both kind of arguing with each other but trying not to argue with each other 
And finally, they both are, have their mouths wide open with their tongues doing weird things, pointing <laughs> in the mouth, leaning over the table. And I'm just sitting at the chair, just laughing hysterically. And everyone thinks we've all lost our minds. <laughs> yeah, well, Chuck, I, I, even though, you know, he had such a gorgeous sound and everything. But for him to give advice on embouchure is kind of crazy because yeah. he played out the side. Yeah, I know. You know? That's yeah. I so mean, Abe, Abe was, was trying to say curious. the real way. Yeah, exactly. And Chuck, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then Alan would come by and go, "Well, you know, Kenny Deverne taught me this fingering," and be like, "Oh, okay." And then Chuck, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have one. I, I have a Kenny Deverne story for yeah. you. Yeah. Um. I met Kenny uh, at Indianapolis in the late 80s, 87 or 88. And we, we did a, a set together, a clarinet set, where I really felt inadequate because it was Johnny Mintz and Chuck Hedges, Kenny Deverne, and me. Now you yeah. have three giant clarinet players. Yeah. Kenny came to my room. Um, or Linda and I, he came up to our room and we were talking about the set. And I had a straight soprano sax. I said, maybe I could just paint my soprano sax black and feel more at home. He says, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be okay. So anyway, the, the set went pretty good. But, and there were some funny moments there. I remember we, we played some tune and on the out chorus we all went total clarinet screaming you know yeah, high. Yeah. we got all done we both we all just looked at one another and started laughing uh-huh kenny got on the mic he was the leader on the set and he said well, i guess bill york will never have that set again he said i just got word there's 200 dogs out in the lobby <laughs> hotel and they're all pissing on the rug well, I really appreciate you taking the time today, Terry. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And, and uh, yeah.